Hi, I'm Kurt Fernley, Paralympian and proud person with a disability. And I'm Sarah Shands, mum of an audiobook addicted kid with a disability. I love the faraway tree. It's not scary like other books. And Moonface and Franny and Beth all go on adventures. I don't really like Connie because she's not very nice. Yeah, I've never really liked Connie either. I'm very sure that you've never read The Faraway Tree, Kurt Fernley. Or have I? I want to take you back to November 24th, 2009. I am absolutely emotionally and physically exhausted. All I want to do is collapse into my bed and sleep for the next week. I've just spent the last 11 long days in brutal conditions crawling the Kokoda track with all of my family and I'm nearly home. One more flight from Brisbane and I'm there. It's done. I go up to the counter to check in. I checked my luggage in and then the staff member said to me that I have to check my wheelchair in. It needs to be treated like my luggage. I remember my heart, it started racing and I'm thinking that this can't happen. If you've ever had your agency taken away, it's terrifying to be on the cusp of that happening again. Often when your agency's taken away, you're at your worst, you're at your most vulnerable and immediately, immediately you go back there. I explained to them as calmly as I could that I take my wheelchair to the door of the aeroplane. I've done it for years. A wheelchair, it's not luggage, it's my legs. Part of me, it feels like it's my life. They refused to listen to me. They said I had two options. To check my wheelchair in here, like luggage. To sit in an aisle chair that's not a wheelchair. I can't touch the wheels. I can't turn left or right. You're about as vulnerable as you can be. Or I make my own way to the gate. Either way, the wheelchair, it's luggage. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal? It's just a different kind of wheelchair. Like I said, it's not a wheelchair. It's not even remotely like a wheelchair. Not like we live in. It's only used in the aisles of planes. There's no independence at all in this chair. Once I get in, they have to push me into the toilet if I have to use it. They choose whether I go left or right. My agency is handed over to someone else. Someone from the airline, they generally have to push you. The moment they leave though, you're on your own. You don't move anywhere. (laughs) Honestly, all you feel when that happens is, it's just fear. (laughs) So I realised at that moment that I was never gonna hop into one of those chairs. I climbed out of my wheelchair and they took it away. I thought if I crawl away from the check-in, that they'll change their mind, right? I thought if I crawl through security, then somebody will see and they'll, They'll change their mind again. They'll understand that that wheelchair, it's not luggage. I thought if I'd crawl to the gate, someone's gonna turn up and they're gonna go, oh, we're sorry about the mistake. I thought if I crawl to this bathroom, because I needed to go to the toilet, if I do this, then maybe no one will have to do it again. But no one did turn up. And I crawled onto the plane But I felt like crawling through that airport, there was more me than giving up every part of my independence that has been demanded in me since I was a kid. I still get anxious every time that I fly that this might happen again. Every time I go to fly, I feel like I'm in that exact spot. And the only thing that you feel is fear. Can you believe that this happened 13 years ago, Kurt? To really understand the barriers people with disability face when flying, you have to start from the beginning, when you book a flight. 
because the entire system from the very beginning makes flying really difficult. Each airline has a different set of rules you have to navigate if you're a person with a disability and you want to fly. If you use a motorised wheelchair, some require you to get a dangerous goods certificate while others don't. And after the court case King versus Jetstar back in 2012, Jetstar limits the number of people who need wheelchair assistance on domestic flights to just two. Carney Liddell was recently told she couldn't fly because of this policy. The reason I was ringing the night before and at 4am that morning of my flight to Proserpine was because Jetstar have a policy of only allowing two people per plane who need assistance. We started talking about the wheelchair and as soon as that happens, I know something is about to go awry. So from there, after an hour, she said to me, you can fly, ma'am, but your wheelchair can't. I said to her, what that'd be like, you taking your legs off, which doesn't really, it doesn't get them on the same level as you, because obviously they can't take their legs off, so they don't actually really get it. There's not, nothing I can really say to them that makes them understand. Anyway, so she said it again, and then when I said about taking her legs off, she told me I was being rude and that she was going to hang up on me pretty much. This two wheelchair rule is the worst. I was taking my family on a holiday to the Gold Coast when I got a call. Mr. Fernley, you can't travel with your family on the flight. There are already two wheelchair users on this flight. You'll have to catch another one. And it's in that moment that you realise, once again, the airline doesn't value you. And my kids see that the airline sees me as less. I'm expendable. I can be kicked off one flight and put on another because of who I am. And that hurts. There are thousands of stories that are similar to what you and Carney have experienced that we'll never hear. And we invited Jetstar to be interviewed for the podcast, but they declined and provided us with a statement saying, Jetstar's top priority is providing safe, comfortable and affordable travel experience to all our customers, including those requiring specific assistance. We provide wheelchair assistance for up to two customers on each domestic flight. The full statement can be found on our website. Airlines and airports have made flying so difficult that people with disability often prefer to take long car trips. This is the case for Jan Pye, who lives in northern New South Wales. She has muscular dystrophy and has recently started to use a wheelchair. She says she'll never fly from Coolangatta Airport again. So we go to the gate and the flight attendant says, now you do realise you can't take your wheelchair onto the tarmac. And I said, yes, I'm well aware of that. And she turns and she points to this wheelchair and says, well, this is the wheelchair that you need to get into. And I looked at her and I said, that looks to me like it's a wheelchair for a child. And she said, well, that's the only wheelchair that's available. And I said, I couldn't even sit in that wheelchair because it was so small and it was very close to the ground. And she said, well, that's the only wheelchair that we've got available and you can't take your wheelchair onto the tarmac. With the help of her husband and a walking stick, Jan is able to walk short distances and knew that if she wanted to get on that flight to Sydney, she'd need to walk to the aeroplane. So you had to walk to the left up this ramp and then to the right and then to the left. Anyway, it was very slow going, I can assure you, but I was fortunate I had my husband with me. And we get to the aircraft door and there was a very deep step. There was nothing in place that I could use to help me into the aircraft. So the flight attendant had to bend down and my husband had to push me from behind to get me into the aircraft. So by this stage, I'm feeling extremely and I repeat that, extremely demoralised, demeaned. I felt that I was offered no respect because there was nothing in place to cater for my disability. 
And, you know, as I explained to the flight attendant, what if I didn't have any legs? How was I supposed to get onto the flight? So we walked to our seat and I sat in the seat and I turned to my husband. And by this stage, I'll be honest, I was nearly in tears. And I said to him, we are never flying out of this airport again. I said, I'm not going through this experience again. We approached Gold Coast Airport, but they didn't respond to our request for a comment. Graham Minnis is a lawyer and former Disability Discrimination Commissioner. He uses a guide dog and was recently flying from Adelaide Airport home when he was treated appallingly by security staff. So I turned up at the security and I happened to be with a colleague and he said, oh, there's a lot of switchbacks that you have to go through. And I know your dog doesn't operate well in those because she doesn't look above her head so she doesn't see the strips between the poles and she just wants to walk straight through them. Why don't we take the faster lane, the priority lane? That happened to be a body scanner. The security guard came and stood in front of me between me and the body scanner and said, you can't come through this lane. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, you can't use the body scanner. And I sort of said, well, how do you know I can't use it? I use them all the time. Not in Adelaide, he said. You don't use them in Adelaide. That's against our regulations. So my colleague and I talked with him for a while. And at one point, the guard actually turned around and walked away. Now, that's a pretty insulting thing to do to a person who can't see. Graham, like most people, wanted to get through security without being patted down and had taken all the necessary precautions to ensure he wouldn't trigger the body scanner. We decided that we didn't want to have an argument, so we decided to go through a different lane, which was a um, walkthrough process rather than a body scanner. So we went to the walkthrough scanner, and again, I started to go through, and the same guard, I think, said, oh, you can't come through here with your dog. Uh, You'll have to be patted down. And I said, no, no, that's okay. I can uh, sit my dog. She will sit here. I'll go through. I know because I've taken all the necessary precautions that one needs to at airports that I will not trigger the scanner. Then I won't have to be patted down. And the only um, patting down will be for the guide dog. And she loves it anyway. So um, it's not a problem. It's all sorted. This is how I do this regularly. I, I fly regularly. And he said, you can't come through here. And... Finally, I convinced him that I could come through and I did exactly as I said. Um, I didn't trigger the scanner, the dog did. And then he said, well, you have to be patted down. That's the regulations. I said, I've just been through all this process to avoid being patted down. We approached Adelaide Airport for comment. They didn't respond to our request for an interview, but provided a statement. This statement is available on our website and essentially says that Adelaide Airport has apologised to Mr Innes for his poor experience and they are reviewing their processes for screening people with assistance animals. Graham has lodged a complaint with the Disability Discrimination Commission, but it will be 12 months before the case is even looked at and who knows how long it will take to get an outcome. I think it's fair to say that if you're a person with a disability, flying can be an extreme sport. But the thing about the disability community is that we're good, really good, at coming up with solutions to the problems that are placed in front of us. It's the system that's the problem and that's why we need systemic change. And the responsibility to change it has been left with the most disempowered group in the process, that is people with disabilities. And the only mechanism we have is like um, chipping away at a hammer with tiles on a tiled floor, getting one little tiny piece off at a time by lodging disability discrimination complaints. Whereas we need to bring in the jackhammer, smash up the tile floor and start again. And what could that look like starting again? I don't think the Disability Discrimination Act is fit for purpose in terms of dealing with this sort of discrimination. I think we what we need is what um, already exists in Europe and in the USA, which is an Airline Accessibility Act, which actually 
directs airlines and airports and the various authorities at airports because, in fact, the security process is not controlled by the Department of Transport. It's controlled by Border Force, but directs all of those people, airlines, airports, and people operating in them to comply in certain ways to provide better service for people with disabilities, makes them accountable so that people with disabilities don't have to lodge the complaint. There's an independent authority which deals with these matters when problems occur. That kind of legislation change could take a while. In the short term, though, we have the Accessible Transport Standards, which are currently being reviewed. They sit under the Disability Discrimination Act. Is it worth looking at strengthening them? There's not really much that is changing in the standards that will have any impact on airlines. They'll just keep going on their own way with their own little separate system for people with disabilities. These reforms will be a blip. They'll make very little difference to the way the airline industry operates. Sometimes I wonder whether the airlines even take the accessible transport standards or the needs of people with disabilities seriously. One of the most baffling things I found out about this issue is that each airline and each airport have different rules around when a person with disability is required to surrender their wheelchair. Sometimes motorised chairs are checked in with baggage and the person with disability is transferred into an aisle chair. They are then taken to the gate and staff will assist with boarding. Akino was recently injured when they were put into an inappropriate aisle chair. I'm getting pushed along and essentially the staff member was quite rough and we went over a bump and I guess like tipped out. Um, But the where I got tipped out because it was like on a bump, it was also right where the metal and glass component of the um, flight bridge was. So that's where I hit my head on the flight, like right onto the metal glass component. And then I hit my ribs and then I fell to the ground and hit, and fell onto my hips and back. And I've had multiple spinal surgeries and I have a spinal injury. So as you can imagine, I was in a lot of pain and I live with chronic pain, but this was a whole nother level. They asked for their own wheelchair to be bought to them, but Jetstar staff refused, saying it wasn't their policy. So their partner had to lift them into another wheelchair so they could leave the airport. We're trying to leave, I'm still in tears, and they're just yelling at my partner and they're just like, trying to say, we deal with hundreds of wheelchairs, thousands of wheelchairs per year, blah, blah, blah. Just remember, you declined medical care. And I'm like, no, 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 I was not in a safe enough space to accept it. They're two separate things. Aki ended up seeing a GP who they trust and was diagnosed with concussion and rib fractures from this incident. We reached out to the airline for comment and the statement essentially says... Customer safety is extremely important and we've reached out to the customer several times to better understand their experience and are yet to hear back. One of the reasons it's so difficult to fly if you are a person with a disability is that the airlines and airports use something called the Equivalent Access Guideline to decide whether a service they provide is equivalent to that of what they would give a non-disabled person. Jeff Trappett is the chair of the committee currently reviewing the accessible transport standards, and he doesn't think the airlines or airports are particularly accessible. I would make the observation at the moment that that situation is not equivalent, but the chance of a person with a disability being able to push that through the court system to prove that inequity is next to zero. So you end up with airlines and airports continuing those processes thinking they're okay. They use the fact that a person with a disability is unlikely to be able to uh, work through the court system to say that no one's ever complained about our process. I don't see how this could be a problem. So if a person with disability faces discrimination or mistreatment during a flight, the main way they'd raise this is through the courts. And this would involve taking on an airline with an army of lawyers. And so these incidents rarely come to light. Michelle Cohen is a lawyer with the Public Interest Advocacy Service and agrees the change is needed. So there is no proactive compliance or enforcement framework. And so the burden is really on individuals with disability um, or with children or other family members with disability to make those complaints on their behalf and to try and advocate 
or try and create change or get an outcome in their individual case through the complaints-based process, which is extremely onerous. Hey, Kurt. Yes, Shans? Is it just me or have I heard this before? It's not just you. This issue of a person with disability who has faced discrimination has to find money and energy to fight this injustice alone. Yes, we've spoken about this in other episodes and something that really needs to change. Inclusive transport just hasn't been prioritised by governments and by transport providers as a means of enablement um, for people with disability across the community. The, it's often said that it's a funding issue. To me, it's not a funding issue. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue of we haven't dedicated the right resources to achieving an end. We approached the new Minister for Transport, Catherine King, for an interview, and she wasn't available. But she is on the record in a recent Guardian Australian article saying... She was very concerned by reports of airport access and assistance issues impacting Australians with disability. It simply isn't good enough, she said. King said the government was fully committed to removing discrimination for people with disability in safely accessing public transport. But I do think we need to find out what fully committed looks like because we're playing catch up for what is a basic human right. It really hurts to hear these stories. It's one of the only parts in life where I I just feel defeated. I can't see a pathway through it yet. I know that we shouldn't have to fight for independence when we are going on holidays or heading to work. And if I'm being honest, I think people with disability are traumatised by their experience flying. <laughs> And that's not okay. For more Auslan versions of the podcast series, Let Us In, subscribe to the ABC Australia YouTube channel.